So yeah, we're really excited to be hosting this. We've been you know, pushing to try to adopt more agile practices. We're trying to basically do that across the board. And we're, we're like a lot of people, I think we're just on a journey through that. And some teams are doing it particularly well. We think we're, you know, we like what they're doing in the development space. We like how they're approaching it. Other teams are, are trying out different, uh, different parts of it. And uh, really, you know, like most people, it's a bit of an exploration. We're just, all we're focused on is really trying to understand how do we add business value? How do we do that as quickly as possible? How do we help our users and our customers uh, achieve um, what they want to when they come to the site, when they actually use our products. So that's really where we're focused on. That's the summary. I don't know if you want me to add anything else. Does that really summarize it? Yeah, that's good. So, so thank you very much. Um, I'm going to hop into another talk now. So I'm just going to close this down. It's going to, so hopefully, if I can, that, okay. Did that work? Am I, am I, okay. So I'll start now on this song. So what I want to talk a little bit is, um, uh, as Leslie explained, I'm a, I'm a senior manager, and what I've thought about a lot is, where my role is in agile leadership. What, what do I do and what role do I play to add value to, lead, to agile teams? Um, the thing that got me thinking about it is when you think about agile teams that are, uh, that are um, self-organizing, they're highly autonomous, I'm going, okay, so what, what actively do I do when I'm thinking about uh, getting involved with agile teams? How do I play a role that is a value add type of role? And so I've presented this talk called Agile Leadership. My, my cunning little working subtitle is Leadership Through Lux, which I think is more of a you know, ringing title than Agile Leadership, and it'll, it'll hopefully becomes apparent why it's called that uh, after a while. So um, when I went and embarked on this process, what I'm really trying to do is I really like to work with models, and I followed this course online of, that Luc de Bran Albert did about sort of what managers can learn from philosophy, and he talked about deduction and versus induction. Uh, deduction being where you sort of take your models and apply them. So, uh, you know, I can look at uh, a chair, for instance, and I know that it's a chair because I have models about how they work and the, the physical description fits that. But induction is where you look at the observe the real model or the real world and you come back and you make models that basically fit what you're trying to observe. And so what I wanted was kind of a physical model around agile leadership that I could uh, play around with in my head. And really what I, I like to do that because it, you can then like, throw new constraints at it. You can try different things. You can, it'll maybe allows you to see things from different perceptions. And uh, I wanted something that I could play around with. So I started to think about what, is, what does agile leadership mean? What do, team, uh, what do teams deliver? And how do I play value in that in terms of a model? Um, so I started with team delivery, saying, OK, so I've got to add value to the team. So there's my team, a well diverse little bunch of people there. Uh, they're, they're kind of congregated close together because they're a very close knit team. And uh, we've got a goal, and really what they do is they try to, over time, you know, just get to that goal from start to finish. Now, this was a simplistic model, and some people might say, that's great, they've got a goal, and they're very, very efficient about how they do that. Um, but it's not really very agile, is it? Because, I mean, really, we know that, in fact, having a very clear, predefined goal ahead of time is not really generally where you'll end up. And, in fact, having a team that consistently and regularly at every marches completely towards that end goal is also not really where we end up. Really, what tends to happen is we have a team and what we have is kind of a general destination we're trying to end up with. Like here's, here's, a, here's a map and there's kind of a, a wider perspective of where they're trying to end up. And really what they're trying to do is that they bark on their journey and over a series of steps and iterations, they kind of meander they wear, they get customer feedback, they get user feedback, they understand a bit more about their problems, and they try to find their way towards what is essentially on the destination somewhere, but it's not an exact point that we've predefined over time. So I was like, okay, great, that looks like a model that I like. And in fact, when I attended Lean Agile Scotland in 2016, Melissa Perry talked about something similar to as a product strategy, so I thought it was, that was quite encouraging, right? You know, she talked about how basically you have to condition targets and vision, and you basically experiment your way towards that goal. Um, so I was like, okay, great. I, I think that's working well. Um, and then when I started to think about this, highlighted now in red, this kind of journey that the team are on, well, as I mentioned, that's a self-organizing, highly autonomous team. So I don't really want to be overbearing on that. I don't want to be micromanaging that. I want to basically be understanding what my role is while still letting them have these attributes of self-organizing and highly autonomous. And so I was thinking, okay, as a leader, what do I role do I play in that? And uh, going back to Melissa Perry's presentation, she actually talked about things like things like visions, goals, and guardrails. I was like, guardrails, okay, I've heard that before. So I'm gonna include that in my model. I've got great, I've got guardrails, okay, that's fantastic. Looks like a nice visual sort of work the model I can work with. Um, the only thing I got concerned about is I'm gonna go in, okay, guardrails are kind of constraining, so, uh, I don't know if anybody recognizes this, but you could end up with basically having constraints that basically look like this. Hey, there we go, now I'm back where I want. Nice tight constraints, 
don't allow any flexibility, and basically you've got the model you started off with, which is really highly efficient. So, and I've been in situations like that where you know you just kind of meander. You're not really meandering. You're kind of just got constraints that just don't allow you to sort of flexibly go anywhere. So um, that's not what I wanted to end up either. What I wanted to think about more was what is this space in there? What am I trying to constrain? And so when I looked at it, I was like, this space here. What we're trying to do is understand more about the destination. It's kind of a an end goal we're trying to reach, a vision. And really, this is exploring the problem space. So this is trying to understand more, what do customers really do in this space? You know, how do our, the features we're developing, how do they actually work when we try them out? We're answering a number of hypotheses, which means that my guardrails are, are really things around, they can be constraints from the problem space. You might have things like performance that might indicate sort of how you're doing things. You might have imposed limitations. You might have budget, for instance, that says, your company says, well, I don't mind you exploring, but here's what, we, here's what we're willing to spend on this solution. We don't want to go beyond that. Um, you might have an agile team charter that defines not only your vision, your goals, but maybe you might have it defines your protocols, how you're going to interoperate, how you're going to uh, uh, act as a team. You might have other ones as well too, but the point is they should be influential in helping the team make decisions. So uh, you want to really think about, if I'm thinking about guardrails, I want to know that they're adding value and I want the team to basically think about that when they're exploring the space, are these constraints, are these uh, other guardrails that I'm putting in, going to help them sort of navigate the course and make their way there. And it's going to help them to make, the, make some decisions. Um, so at that point, I was like, okay, I've got some guardrails, I like that, uh, working around that model in my head. And what I was realizing is that, you know, what we were talking about here is really the context in which they're operating. And I was sort of playing around with this and going, that's really where I think as an agile leader, that's where I want to focus on. As I said, I don't want to focus directly on manipulating the team to a certain degree. What I want to do is I want to think about what context and how do I help and build that context for them to achieve uh, or most likelihood of success. Um, so. I was having that, you know, that thought. I was thinking guardrails, got that, thinking about my, you know, doing that. And I'm thinking about context and environment for teams. And I, I walk by this, the Linlithgow Union Canal Society, or Lux, for those of you who are paying attention in the beginning slide. Some of you in here may recognize this from uh, close by. So I live in Linlithgow, so I was walking by this. And I'm, I'm thinking, as I'm doing this kind of hand motion as I'm walking along the canal path, I'm going, well, you know what? Actually, the canal kind of looks like that model as well, too. So so maybe, maybe I can think about you know, what teams deliver in terms of a model of a canal. So this, maybe I, how does that work? Well, let's see, I've got sort of canal banks, and you know, these are man-made items, so I can define what the canal banks, how wide they are. They kind of represent my constraints. I've still got, well, a treasure map. That's pretty good for being on water. And, you know, not sure there's any pirates in there, but this is kind of like you know, a, a good model to work with. And I've got this kind of flow of water. Uh, and the real key is, does that really help me in terms of thinking about agile leadership? Does it really change where I was before? Well. What I thought about is, in fact, you can change this now to give depth to your whole equation. So now I've got a model that has depth to it. Okay, if I have a model that has depth to it, what can I do with that? How does that make me think about agile leadership? Well, here I've got a kind of a flat, smooth terrain on the bottom of my, um, in my, you know, my journey, I guess, really. But that's not always the case. You know, it could, it could be that I've got a rocky journey, a rocky terrain to go in on the bottom. Or it could be that I have a non-smooth rocky terrain. In fact, it could be that my canal is not smooth at all. My canal might look like that. And I think a few people might recognize sort of delivery journeys that probably feel a bit like that when they actually go through it. Um, so start to think about, you know, that's okay when I'm, I'm looking at that. And these poor guys got to basically look at that too. And they're going, how are we basically going to get successfully through this journey? Um, so that's why I start to think about, uh, as an agile leader, okay, what they're encountering at this point. And what they're really encountering is turbulence. So now I've got this model where I've encountered a turbulent flow through my journey, and that's really what my, my team are going to encounter. And what does that turbulence really represent in terms of a, a you know, tangible, realistic view? It represents things like market conditions. I mean, if you're actually deploying new products into market conditions which are highly volatile, you might have new competitors coming in, you might have people doing all kinds of new things that you need to keep track of, and they're going to throw you in different directions. You might have internal projects and changes. Certainly in the public sector, operate, or we operate in, we have a number of projects undergo at any point in time simultaneously. Those things may come across your path, may impact the projects you're working on, and may impact the teams in terms of their delivery. Um, they may just represent uncertainty. So if you're working in an, in an area where you're developing new items, which maybe uh, have a little bit more or a lot more kind of new things that may prop up and you might get different feedback from your customers you weren't expecting, it may throw you in a new direction. And that kind of level of turbulence is really what I was thinking about when I started to continue with this model. So the question then, as I thought, is how do I best equip the teams to deal with this level of turbulence? So as I was thinking about that, 
I thought about appropriate tooling. And again, I went back to you know, the place of like Lean Agile Scotland 2015. Alicia Wawero talked about um, thinking fail safe. And she had this view of sort of a canoe on a lovely lake. And she was identified the fact that the canoe is absolutely great, very well designed for going on a nice smooth lake, gets you there very efficiently, very quickly. But in fact, when you meet turbulent waters, the canoe may not be the best, most appropriate piece of equipment you want for that. And it may actually lead you into different uh, challenges and difficulties. Maybe what you want is actually a raft. Raft much more flexible, much more, um, much more uh, uh, what you call probably anti-fragile, basically way of dealing with the turbulence that you've got to deal with. And I was like, okay, that's helpful, because now as an agile leader, I can focus on what kind of equipment I can help the teams to manage the turbulent water maybe they're going to be going through. So do I want to give them a canoe? Do I want to give them a, a raft? And, and while these are physical kind of manifestations of kind of equipments, I, I wrote the I specifically wrote like, how do I equip the teams, not equipment, because I was thinking it could be a, as well as certain skill as well too, because it's not just, if you, even if you're driving a, or paddling a raft, knowing how to do so efficiently and, and well, probably helps you manage that turbulent water as well. So that's where I got to with this thinking. And then I was thinking, actually what I need to do then is really understand how turbulent water manifests itself. Now this is actually turbulent water, but really, the analogy we're looking at here is, I need to understand what, what actually is going to manifest itself into turbulent water. We talked about things like market conditions, but I need to understand that in terms of the actual world problems that we're going to encounter delivering software, delivering solutions. What things might come up, and I need to be looking at that in order to predict what's going to happen, how much turbulence are we likely to achieve, how much, how, and therefore making sure the teams are equipped appropriately. As well, I need to be able to sort of get an insight into the turbulence and be able to predict and help them navigate that. So, is there an area, how can I help my teams actually navigate that level of turbulence and find out where the safe journeys are? What, might they, what, I can, what can I help them do to mitigate where they might run into more troubling waters and say, okay, actually we don't want to go here, we want to go down there and help them achieve those kind of levels of direction. Um, so that's fine. Now, so I've got turbulent areas, I've got sort of, you know, uh, managing turbulent waters. That's something I've now bring on board for my agile leadership. But what if my landscape that I'm dealing with kind of looks like this? That's not, great if you're, that's not great if you're dealing with a canal. You know, uh, that's my model kind of going, how do I deal with that if I'm a canal now? This is my, my model I'm working with. Well, we have examples where people have dealt with this because they've introduced things like locks. But that's a very manual process that they've introduced to try to you know, get themselves around that, that particular landscape environment issue. Um, maybe what I want to think about is that might be appropriate for some of the things we're doing. Maybe we've got some processes where, you know what, a manual option is basically the best way of doing that. However, I may also want to invest in an automated solution that actually accomplishes the same thing, probably does so in a bit more, a higher level of investment, but if I'm willing to do that, maybe I get a better return because actually the investment's going to pay off over a period of time and I'm going to increase in actual the flow through the area. I'm going to increase as the Falkirk wheel does and in fact, I'm going to get that return. So I'm going to want to think about how those things, what kind of, um, what kind of environment conditions do I help the team set up? How much do we invest to help the teams automate and go through that process? So I also wanted to think about, well, I've got this nice model, thinking about automation, thinking about manual steps, thinking about turbulence. What about the flow itself? So here I've got a nice flow of water going through a canal. But what if I can make it do that? What if I can actually say, can I help the flow actually go downhill? For those that have been part of, you know, if you're in that kind of situation when you're on a body of water, certainly going downhill would seem to make it easier for people. So um, what does that actually represent? Well, I think in this case, water is a very good analogy for this because water actually seeks the path of minimal resistance. And I think from what I've experienced, mostly like software development teams, pretty much everybody you know, seeks the path of least resistance when they're trying to get things done. They want to get the outcomes and they try to get there doing the easiest things possible. So if I can set up the processes that I want followed and making sure that the right outcome I want is also the easiest path, then I'm more likely to get the right outcomes every time I do it. So what I think about as you start to think about the processes when I see people going through journeys is when we do encounter problems, I try to go back and think about, okay, if we've had this outcome that we didn't want, how do we get the right out? Let's, let's identify, first of all, what is the right outcome and how do we get the process to deliver, um, make it that the easiest possible way to get things done anyway. So that would that have sort of flown, brought into my agile leadership kind of backpack. And I was thinking about that, okay, this model's actually, you know, helping me think about these other aspects over time. Finally, I was thinking about, 
actually, you know what, I can also think about what is the actual environment, what's the air, what's the atmosphere that they operate in? And probably not surprising uh, as a leader, what I think about then is things like, what's the career development opportunities? What's the training I provide? How much do I invest in my people? What's the communication? Uh, like, do I, you know, do I reg regularly communicate with them, give them ideas about where we're heading, what we're trying to do, get them engaged in that, provide a level of trust, uh, or reward and recognition? How does that all work within the environment? That's a lot of really the, the cultural aspects that we think about. So from that standpoint, I was like, okay, that's another aspect I can bring in that whole agile model I'm developing around this canal-based system. Um, so really, that's kind of the summary of where I ended up. I started to think about Okay, this, and it's really a work in progress for me, but it's kind of an ongoing piece of, uh, uh, of agile leadership that I try to focus on. How do I do better at this as an agile leader? What can I focus on more? But the model I think is interesting to play around with, and um, maybe it might help you guys out if you guys uh, can you know, talk to your leaders and how you think about things. But really, we talked about how you know, a map really transitions into things like goals and visions. You have sides and guardrails that transitions into things like constraints and limitations. Um, and introducing the area of turbulence, and really what I'm trying to do here is get predictions, equip the teams appropriately with the appropriate tools and skills to navigate what they're trying to do. And, and when I think about navigation, it's really looking at planning and anticipation. Try to I basically understand what things might impact the team as they go forward. How do we basically mitigate those impacts as much as possible? In terms of the landscape, trying to figure out what we can automate, what do we invest in? Where do we try to make sure we make the right investments? Uh, thinking about flow, really this is about reducing friction in our process, trying to make sure the seat processes are as seamless as possible. How do we basically improve them? And finally, the air and the atmosphere, and this is really around the organization culture. How do I basically help develop that and spur that on to basically help the team achieve? So I come up with is that, that, that model really I think helps me sort of focus on these areas and think about them over time. And I try to think about how well they're working and how well they're I'm achieving that and how well the teams are doing. So, that was really the end of my talk, and that's really all I wanted to sort of focus on. So hopefully that was informative for you, or at least uh, entertaining nonetheless. And uh, I thank you very much for your time. If there's any questions, I don't know yet. Yeah.